this morning we're going to look more at curves. Polygonal curves, we're going to look more at uh, polymers also. I think both of you are going to talk about curves. And uh, so let's uh, Jason, I met the first time Jason. I, I wonder if the third time we'll meet, it'll be again in a situation where it's humid and hot. The first time we met was in Barbados. <laughs> now it's uh, Singapore. Where else will we meet next time? Let's find a cold place. All right. Canada, and <laughs> Canada in the winter, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to come to this workshop. It's been fascinating, um, and I've learned a lot from listening to all the talks so far. Um, and uh, it's also been fascinating to come to Singapore, uh, which has been beautiful and amazing. So thank you all for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, a sort of big picture uh, of the geometry of space curves and polygons. And I should say, um, this is a framework that uh, my research group and I did not invent. Um, it uh, was invented you know, in the 90s by symplectic geometers and differential geometers. But I think uh, the people who invented it were not terribly interested in applications. They had other pure math things to do in mind. Uh, and the people who wanted to do applications, the papers weren't necessarily accessible. So what we've really done in all this is just try to translate this into more accessible terms and point out some of the applied math implications of um, these sort of larger scale differential geometric theorems. So of course, um, Space curves show up all the time in biology. Um, so even at, at very small scales, those are polymers up top, uh, a protein. But at macro scales, too, uh, there's a plant tendril. Um, uh, on the left is cowpea root. Um, that's a project I'll talk about at the end of the talk a little bit, um, work in progress. And the idea is that you want to understand these shapes, you want to compare them to one another, you want to cluster them, uh, you want to classify them. Um, and in all these things, it's sort of helpful to have uh, a big framework in, for, in which all the shapes live. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to go back and forth between smooth curves and polygons. Um, there's a version of this that works for smooth curves. There are versions that work for polygon space. Um, and then we'll just start with open curves and we'll gradually add different constraints that might be useful or, or relevant. Um, and we'll see all along that using this sort of fancy structure leads to very practical algorithms um, and things to compute. So let me start at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to write things in terms of quaternions. So like the crash course, if you don't remember it, uh, is that quaternions are like complex numbers, but there are more of them. Uh, there are three square roots of negative 1 instead of 1. Um, and they have the property that if you multiply the three of them together, you get negative 1. Um, and the reason these turn up all over the place is because the unit quaternions are a way to write orthonormal frames. Um, and this is sort of standard in computer graphics, is to write uh, frames as quaternions, because composition of frames is like quaternionic multiplication. And there are a number of really in, uh, convenient properties of writing things this way. So just to write down exactly what the map is, um, it's this thing called the Hopf map where you conjugate your quaternion with i, j, or k to get the three vectors in the frame. So q bar i, q is the first vector, and the other two turn out to be perpendicular always to the first one and to each other by the algebraic properties on the top of the slide. Um, you might say, but quaternions are, oh, say, okay, so quaternions are four-dimensional. There's a real component and an i, j, and k component. But all these vectors are purely imaginary. So 
they are just sort of naturally vectors in R3. Mm. OK, now, um, here's something that you can do, and it'll become clear in a minute why you might like to do it. Um, if you have a vector of quaternions, you can build a vector of frames and take the first vector in each frame to be the edge of a polygon. So you can build up a polygon that's framed, all the edges are different lengths, as a vector in quaternionic end space. Hmm. Um, so that's the first part of the construction. And that's a construction for framed polygons in, in R3. Hmm. OK, now, here's the first nice thing about it. If you want the polygons to have total length 1, um, it turns out to be the condition that your vector of quaternions has total length 1. Um, now, that's like slightly surprisingly good, right? Because the condition that the sum of edge lengths is 1 is like an L1 condition. The, sum of a bunch of numbers is 1. But L1 conditions aren't very pretty geometrically. You want it to be an L2 condition. And so by writing the edges as um, the Hopf map applied to the quaternions, the length of the edges is now the square of the length of each quaternion. So the L1 sphere becomes the L2 sphere, and the L2 sphere is nice. Um, so this is the original appeal of this construction, is that fixed length is easy to see. Um, the next useful feature is pose, right? So if you're trying to compare curves, you want a metric that's translation invariant and rotation invariant, so you don't have to register the, curve against, the curves against one another. Now, this picture is already translation invariant because we're dealing with the edges instead of the vertices. Um, so the edges are the same regardless of translation. But interestingly, um, let me get back to that slide in a minute. Uh, rotation corresponds to multiplying the vector by a quaternionic scalar. So um, I. If I multiply the vector by a quaternionic scalar, I rotate the whole polygon rigidly in space. And that means that the space of polygons up to rotation and translation is quaternionic projective space. Um, sorry, w is now a unit quaternion? Oh, yeah, W, sorry, is a unit quaternion. Yeah, that's right. So it's not really SO3 if it's non-unit vectors. They're just orthogonal, and they all have the same length. Um, but it's, you're right. It's like SO3 times positive numbers or something. It's the cone on SO3. Uh, but if it's a unit quaternion, it really is in SO3. Um, so the picture is that. Um, framed length one polygons up to translation and rotation are just quaternionic projective space, um, period. And that's nice, because that gives you a strategy for comparing, uh, I don't know, say, protein shapes, mm -hmm. um, which is automatically pose independent. And the distance is sort of trivial to compute. Um, like. Specifically, it's um, the arc cosine of these dot products here, um, where this is the quaternionic inner product, which, like the Hermitian inner product, means that you sum the quaternionic products of the entries in here and the conjugates of the entries in here. Um, so it's like P1Q1 bar plus P2Q2 bar and so forth. Um, this thing on the top will be real, um, uh, as will these things on the bottom. Um, and notice that if you multiplied everything in sight by a unit quaternion w, that would all cancel. Um, so it's clear from the description that this metric is pose independent already. Mm. Um, now, here are. Here's an interesting experiment. 
Right, so this is just sort of a proof of concept experiment where my student, uh, Tom Needham, now at Ohio State, took 10 different proteins from the PDB as open curves and just computed the pairwise distances between them uh, according to this metric and got a list of geodesic distances and made the dendrogram. So he discovered that um, these two guys, 1A5G and 1A61, were close. Um, you know, other things were further apart. There's 1A5G and 1A85. Um, and you can see, if you look these up in the PDB, that there's a reason that 1A5G and 1A61 are close. Right? They're both thrombin. <laughs> um, uh, well, they're thrombin complexed with, I think, two different things. Um, so, it, uh, so you're picking up uh, meaningful similarities between the protein shapes um, just at this level of computation. Okay, now... Do, do the proteins have the same size? Do this, well, uh, you can do a couple things, right? You can scale them to have the same size, like, you know, you can downsample, or you can just uh, do a sliding window thing where you compute it. Um, kind of the point is that these dot products are so fast um, that it's completely practical to do um, sub-matching if, if that's what you want to do. Um, and you can see in the picture, right, this is the alignment um, that, was uh, that was discovered automatically um, by, the, by the distance function above. Uh, and it's a really good alignment. I mean, you can see it's not perfect, right? Here is a loop of the red one um, where it's complex with a different thing. So these aren't actually the same protein. Um, but you can see that where they're supposed to follow each other, you know, they really do. So, and this alignment, of course, is, um, you know, provably optimal in, you know, in the sense of this metric, right? This is, sorry, how does the distance function give you an alignment? Uh, the whole setup gives you an alignment, I should say, right? So it's, uh, it's easy to figure out given two representatives of a, of a quaternionic line in quaternionic projective space, right, what the quaternionic scalar is to get the closest point on this quaternionic line to a given point on that quaternionic line, right? And solving that problem gives you the alignment between the two explicitly, between the two representatives explicitly. Mm. I would be enormous, yes. Um, so the idea is that since this is a distance between edges, um, this is more like um, this is more like a Sobolev distance, right? So you're comparing the derivatives um, pointwise, and you're seeing that the derivatives pointwise are different. Whereas root mean square is like the integral of this thing, right? So that because you're comparing vertex positions. Um, so, so this is a, this is a different thing, um, you know, uh, and the root mean square distances are of course bigger. The furthest apart you can ever be in this metric is pi over two, um, because in projective space, you know, you're sort of, the distance is sort of the angle between the two lines, um, and the angle between two lines in the sphere, uh, is really never more than, than pi over two. Mm. Uh, no, I think that is the best alignment that you can get. Um, it's just not very good. Um, now, right, because they're far apart. Mm. Uh, they are also pushed aside from one another a little bit uh, by translation so you can see them. Mm. Oh, um, 
In this one, uh, the center of mass, uh, the centers of mass are um, just superimposed, um, which is, you know, according to uh, your choice of convention, you know, sort of the optimal thing to do is superimpose the centers of mass. In this one, the centers of mass are not superimposed just because you can't see the blue curve very well. It just looks like a mass inside the red curve. Mm. Oh, uh, no, the, well, the centroids are invisible to this distance, right? Because this is a distance on edges in the first place. So, you know, so exactly how you would align the 3D things is up to you. you the, the two obvious choices are take the first vertex to be at the same point and rebuild them from there, or take the center of mass at the same point and rebuild them from there. Um, and I should say that since my student made these pictures, I am not entirely sure which one he did because sometimes he did one and the other. And I think maybe here he aligned the first vertex. Mm. Um, and here it's maybe hard to tell because the alignment is so good that whether he aligned the first vertex or the center of mass, uh, they're still going to be on top of one another. Mm. Oh. oh, you get the full Euclidean group. Oh, okay, this is like, um, so I've seen this in like geometric algebra. There are like so rotors and here. wrenches and, okay. Yeah, that, that might be interesting. Yeah. That might be interesting for us. You know, we've also thought of doing like, an octonionic version of this for polygons in a higher dimensional space. Um, uh, but it's weirder, you know, the, the algebra is worse. Um, so, uh, so one thing you might, you might ask when you look at this is you're like, okay, here geodesic distance of 1.32 seems to mean they have nothing in common. Whereas geodesic distance of 0 0.27 seems to mean they're almost exactly the same. Now, of course, I could tell you exactly what the metric means. You know, it means the total distance between tangent vectors is, adds up to this crazy number. But, you know, what does that mean in practice? So a reasonable question to ask is, what's the probability that two random curves are within 0.27 or, say, 1.32? And one of the nice things about this picture is that there are very simple answers to these kinds of questions. Um, you know, explicitly uh, this. Um, so, oh, this slide has a typo on it. Okay, um, I thought I uploaded the new version. This is supposed to be a D and not a D over two. Um, so the probability that two things are within distance D of one another is uh, just sine, uh, sine d to the 4n. <laughs> so what you see is that um, if you pick two random things, they're almost certainly at distance pi over 2. Um, and a distance of 0.27 uh, is incredibly significant. I mean, you have to measure it in bits or something because you know it's like 10 to the minus 138 or something for the example I, I saw above. Um, but it gives you a precise uh, sense in which you can answer these questions. Um, if you want to answer questions about, um, you know, how likely is it to have an equilateral thing or a thing that's close to equilateral, you can say more. Um, I'll go back to this slide. As a probability space, this thing is sample all the directions uniformly and independently sample the edge lengths from this particular Dirichlet distribution on the simplex of numbers that sum to one. Uh, so again, this is natural enough and easy to work with. So if you want to know how likely it is that your tangent, your direction vectors are all within uh, a certain angle of your target guy and your edge lengths are all within a certain box uh, amount of your target edge lengths, you can answer those questions easily using the probability distribution function explicitly. Um, now, 
I should say that this probability might not be the biologically relevant one, right? Um, after all, you wouldn't expect proteins to be sampled uniformly from the distribution on N-edge polygons. You'd be, expect them to be sampled according to some weighted distribution where things with self-intersections were extremely improbable or things which uh, had a bad score according to the potential function given by the chemistry were improbable. But the idea is that you could superimpose those things on this picture in a rigorous way. Mm. Um, Okay, so let's try to keep going. Um, uh, okay, so suppose you want the polygons to be closed. Um, I like this because I, I originally got into this stuff doing knots with John and Rob and uh, this whole group. Um, so I was really interested in closed curves and random closed curves. And it turns out that closure has a very natural interpretation in this framework. Um, so I have to express it uh, using one more construction. So just like a real number is a pair, sorry, just like a complex number is a pair of real numbers, you can write a quaternion as a pair of complex numbers. Um, and that means that our vector of quaternions is really two vectors of complex numbers, one given the real and i part of the quaternion and one given the j and k parts of the quaternion. Um, and the, the amazing theorem is that the polygon closes and has fixed length if and only if those two complex vectors are orthonormal. Um, so you can replace the closure constraint, which is sort of awkward to deal with, with orthonormality, which is like the easiest to handle constraint in all mathematics or something, right? Um, so uh, the proof is just a calculation. Um, and again, this is, um, this is not mine. This was observed uh, by Alan Knudsen and Jean-Claude Haussmann in the 90s. Um, uh, you do the computation and you note that um, uh, if you write the Hopf map in terms of the quaternions, the I portion is given by the difference of the squares of the, com the norms of the complex numbers. The J and K portion is given by the product of the complex numbers. Um, and so if you add this up over the whole polygon, this says that the norms of the two complex vectors are the same. This says that their dot product is zero. Their Hermitian inner product is zero. Mm. So now this gives you a natural way to see how closed polygons fit into open polygons. Open polygons are quaternionic projective space. Closed polygons are this space of orthonormal frames in complex N space. Um, Okay, that's called the Stiefel manifold, um, frames in complex N space. Um, and the question now is, of course, like, well, how do rotations fit in? And it turns out that rotations are great. Um, rotations just spin the frame within the, the two planes spanned by the two complex vectors. Um, uh, that's part of the action. And the other action is to take all the frames and rotate them simultaneously. Um, so if you do that, if you mod out by simultaneous rotation of the frame and rotation in space, you get the space of two planes in complex N space, uh, which is the Grossman manifold. Okay, so, you know, if you're a Biologist, um, maybe you could boil this down as um, uh, if you have a closed curve or a ring polymer or something, uh, then it's this very standard mathematical space uh, where there are lots of tools to use. Mm. So, okay. That's right, sorry, yeah. At the bottom it means, poly, and the top it means 
closed, really framed polygons up to translation is the Stiefel manifold. On the bottom, it means closed, relatively framed space polygons up to translation and rotation. Um, which, uh, you know, if you're like, I don't know, if you're a differential geometer, um, this was very satisfying to me because I've always, you know, no, I've always been troubled by the fact that there are two ways to frame a space curve. There's the Frenet frame, uh, which we saw yesterday, and there's the Bishop frame, uh, which just tracks along the curve. But the Bishop frame is a relative frame. It's not an absolute frame. And it turns out that because of this structure, the Bishop frame is the natural frame uh, for space curves in, as planes in the Grassmannian, the Frenet frame is different. The Frenet frame is, uh, is unnatural in this perspective because it, uh, it requires you to fix a base point. OK, so again, um, you can compute distances. And now these are distances which are invariant, again, under translation and rotation. But they're not. Um, the distance along an evolution that might require you to break the curve, go through a bunch of open curves, and close it up again at the end. We could have done that in quaternionic projective space. Now I want the distance through curves that stay closed the whole time. Um, that's a harder problem. Um, but because we have so much structure, it's not hard to calculate. Um, it turns out that you take the bases for the two planes, and you make the two by two matrix that you get by taking all pairwise dot products of these complex vectors. Uh, and then you find the singular values of the two by two matrix. And then there are various conventions, like take the L2 norm of the singular, of the arc cosines of the singular values. That's the geodesic distance. Or take the L2 norm of the signs of the, the angles. Um, that's called the chord distance. Um, and it's more useful in some applications. Um, but again, uh, it's a linear time calculation, right? You do these, these four dot products. Uh, and then you do the matrix, uh, the two by two matrix calculation. And of course, this is fast enough that if you want to match subcurves or something, or you want to match a whole lot of curves, um, uh, uh, you, you can do this calculation like many, 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 many times quickly. Mm -hmm. This is for polygons of the same length. So now if you want to compare polygon, closed polygons of different length, you have a couple of options. Um, there are a number of interesting papers about finding distances between planes in different Grassmannians, right? And it amounts to, um, you know, one thing you can do is embed one Grassmannian in the other Grassmannian, right? Um, that gives you a distance function that works. Um, the other thing you can do is go to, clo uh, go to smooth curves, right, and say, well, I'll, um, I'll spline both curves, and then you have sort of an invariant distance um, between the splines, right? If you're really worried about the actual geometric length in space, you should just rescale them to length two. Um, but I presume you're worried about the number of vertices. Mm. Yeah, so, so there are a number of ways to handle the number of vertices problem. Ah, uh, yeah. That's probably doable. Um, it's worth thinking about, right? Because the, where you put the insertions and deletions is a question of how you embed the little Grassmannian into the big Grassmannian, like which coordinates you're going to ignore. Um, so you could compute it over all possible insertions and deletions, but that's, you know, that would require a bit of computer science to organize the calculations uh, efficiently. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good point, is that that would be a cool thing to do. Mm. So all this discussion of framing makes me want to ask, back when you were comparing proteins from the database, are they in the database as framing terms? 
Well, proteins actually have um, a, a chemical framing that you would get from how the side chains come out. Um, but, or you could take sort of a discrete Frenet frame. Um, and it's not clear to me, I don't have the biological intuition to know which one I should do. Um, I think in Tom's example, he took the, like a discrete Frenet frame. Um, but you could try for a more natural chemical framing, right? Uh, Okay, I defer to Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what did our experiments do? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so I believe that Tom used, I, Tom and I discussed this for quite a while, and I think the one he used for that picture was a discrete Frenet frame. Um, uh, but you know, it's not, but there are, but there are options. Yeah. Uh -huh. It would have non-zero distance. And when you try to align them, um, you get the perfect alignment and just not see the frames wouldn't be aligned? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I haven't done that experiment. Uh, um, OK, so I should say that this has shown up in shape comparison before. So. Um, uh, uh, Jones, Mishor, Mumford, Shaw um, have like a sort of uh, classic paper where they compare curves in the plane as a real Grassmannian. Um, and indeed, like that real Grassmannian is the real Grassmannian inside the complex Grassmannian that we're talking about. So if all our guys happen to be real, you'd get a plane curve and you'd get the metric on plane curves that was described by, by Jones et al. Um, and the point here is that um, it maybe hasn't been as clear to people in shape comparison that there was an analogous thing in three dimensions. Um, uh, I don't know, in, in the complex world, the Hopf map is just squaring the complex number. And this is sometimes called like, the squaring process or like the square root metric or something on plane curves. Um, and so it might not have occurred to people that you could generalize that to quaternions and complex curves. Um, so, but that's sort of the connection with standard um, shape comparison. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the thing about this picture, um, and we got into this because we were interested in random knots and random curves, um, is that there's so much structure that you can actually do calculations explicitly. Um, so for instance, um, we worked out the expected total curvature of a closed polygon, um, uh, which hadn't been done before, but it turns out that this has enough structure that you can do it exactly. And you get this kind of neat result that if you have a closed n-gon, it has to turn a little more than a random open n-gon. Uh, a random open n-gon should have uh, n turns, which could either be acute or obtuse with equal probabilities. So the expectation is pi over 2 times the number of turns. Um, for a closed thing, it has to turn a little more because it's got to get back to where it started. Um, so the probability that any given turn is obtuse is just a little more than the probability that it's acute. Um, so, and it turns out that that little extra um, is, it was known to be something that was asymptotic to pi over four as n goes to infinity. And in fact, it's exactly pi over four times two n over two n minus three. Um, and you know, you can get it because this whole setup is so nice that you can eventually write down the integral and do it. Um, you know, you can get uh, kind of fun results like this. Um, 
that if you take hexagons, um, at least a third of hexagons are unknots uh, because they don't have enough curvature uh, to turn around twice and form a knot. An eleventh of heptagons are unknots. Um, this is way off, by the way. Uh, the number, the fraction of knots inside hexagons is something like a ten thousandth. Mm. So 99.999% of hexagons are unknots. Uh, but it's hard to actually um, prove a theorem about it. Mm. Okay, so let's go further. Um, if you want to describe um, proteins or polymers or something where you know where the vertices are, um, then you know where the vertices are and you know what the edge lengths ought to be and you should stick with that. But if you have something like a plant tendril, uh, it's like a continuous model um, or uh, you know, a polymer where you know that all the monomers are the same, then you really want to restrict your attention to equilateral polygons instead of polygons of arbitrary edge length. Now you want to be able to do things like compute probabilities and distances among only equilateral closed polygons instead of all closed polygons. So you can go further. You can reduce by fixing the edge lengths. Um, so here's how you do it technically. Um, uh, you, it's a symplectic reduction. Uh, and you take all the frames on the, um, uh, on each edge, and you observe that spinning the frame around the edge has the conserved quantity edge length. So these two things are paired. Um, so that means you ought to be able to symplectically reduce fixing the value of edge length, the conserved quantity, um, and modding out by the S1 action, uh, rotating the frame. Now, there are n minus one of these rotations because it's relatively framed. But remember, I already fixed the total length. So if I fix n minus one edge lengths, I fix the last one too. Um, so uh, you can describe equilateral polygons technically as this symplectic reduction of the Grassmannian by a circle, uh, by a torus, by the circle to the n minus first power. OK, now this may not mean anything uh, if, you're a, if you're in mathematical biology. Um, but let me show you the consequence, um, which is much more useful. So we were really interested in random equilateral polygons. Um, and the point of being a symplectic space is that it gives you a number of powerful theorems to work with, which turn out to address volume and measure extremely well. So here's one of them. Um, there's this, uh, Noether's theorem says that if you have a symmetry, you have a conserved quantity. Um, this is just some like general principle from mechanics. Um, uh, a later version of this is something like um, if you have a symplectic space, um, which is like a more generalized version of the um, classical mechanics spaces that Noether was originally thinking about, um, then if you have decommuting symmetries, then you have deconserved quantities. So the number of symmetries equals the number of conserved quantities. Um, and furthermore, that the probability distribution of the conserved quantities is piecewise polynomial, and it has degree um, m minus d. That is to say, half the dimension of the total space minus the number of conserved quantities. So that the probability distribution gets simpler the more conserved quantities you have. Now, there's an example of this that everybody knows. Um, but you might not know that you know. Um, so, right, here's this example that if you teach multivariable calculus,
you say, okay, I have this sphere and I have some band of height h and I want to know the area of that band, right? And I'm sure you all know like the, the cool theorem, right? So what's the cool theorem about like the, the area of the band of height h? Yeah, very good. <laughs> that I didn't have to tell you which band, right? That it only depends on, on H. Okay, so that is the Deustermatt Heckman theorem, okay, in the following sense. Uh, the sphere is a symplectic manifold, its dimension is 2. So 2 times m equals 2. Mm. Um, now, the symmetry is rotating the sphere around the North Pole. The conserved quantity is z, the height along the z-axis. Um, that means that the distribution, the probability distribution of z, the conserved quantity, is piecewise polynomial of degree m minus d. That is to say, 1 minus 1. So the probability distribution of z is constant along minus one to one, uh, which is like a fact that people know in probability, right? The right way to sample a sphere is to choose the z coordinate uniformly in minus one to one and choose the theta coordinate uniformly in zero to two pi. Um, okay, so we're gonna do exactly that, but to sample equilateral polygons. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, Polygons are 2n minus 6 dimensional. Well, okay, um, they're equilateral, so every edge is a point on the sphere. There are n of them, so that's 2n dimensional. But I modded out by translations, which is 3, and rotations, which is 3 more. So the whole thing is 2n minus 6 dimensional to start with. That means that m is 2n minus 3. Okay, now I'm going to find n minus 3 commuting symmetries. And they go like this. Um, if I draw chords between one point on the polygon and the other vertices, it turns out there are n minus 3 such non-crossing chords. Uh, I did the example so you didn't have to sketch it. <laughs> um, but I always had to do the pentagon and do it and be, okay, n minus 3 and not n minus 2 or n minus 1 or something. Um, okay, now the deustermatt heckman theorem means that if I think of the joint distribution of all these distances from points in the random polygon to the first vertex, that that joint distribution is uniform. After all, m was n minus 3, and there were d equals n minus 3, so the resulting deustermatt heckman distribution is dimension 0, or sorry, is piecewise polynomial of degree 0, which means it's constant. Um, so, uh, so once you realize this, you realize that the probability theory of polygon space is going to be way easier than you thought it would be. Um, in particular, uh, these distances are going to be uniformly sampled on their domain. Um, now, of course, wait, you have to think about what their domain is because it's not, uh, it's not totally trivial. Um, so if you think about these two distances, well, remember that all the outer edges of the pentagon are length 1. So that d1 here can't be larger than 2. Um, and it, of course, it can't be smaller than 0. Um, and then this length is 1 as well, so there's some relation between d1 and d2. They can't differ by length more than 1, or their endpoints couldn't be close enough together to connect with a unit length edge. If you add up all these triangle inequalities, you get this pentagon, um, uh, which is sort of the pentagon of pentagons, right? Every pentagon is described by a point in this pentagon uh, and two angles. Um, so I'll draw the angles, right? 
to rebuild the pentagon, you pick two distances uh, that obey the triangle inequalities, build all the triangles, and realize that you can rotate these triangles arbitrarily with respect to one another. So you get um, some construction that recovers like a unique space five gone um, from two angles and two distances. <sighs> okay, now, um, and remember, okay, these are called action angle coordinates. Um, so remember that the volume form is just Euclidean in the distances and Euclidean in the angles. So if you want to do probability calculations, um, I guess I claim that it might be nice to try them in these coordinates um, because you know uh, what the metric looks like. Okay, so here's another one, right? Hexagon space is this three-dimensional thing. Um, which is defined by various triangle inequalities. The first and the last one have length no more than two. The middle ones differ in length by no more than one. And if you write this all out, um, oh, and there's a funny one, right? Uh, this one is weirder. It says that um, two adjacent points can't be too close to the first vertex. If they're both within one of the first vertex, they can't get far enough apart to put an edge between them. Um, this one will be the troublesome one. Okay, but using this structure, um, uh, my co-authors and I were able to come up with, um, uh, you know, maybe the best direct sampling algorithm for equilateral closed polygons. And the way it works um, is now like easy to see. Um, you're just trying to sample points in the moment polytope uniformly. So the question is, how do I get points in this high dimensional polytope? That's not always easy to do, um, but it turns out that if you make a change of coordinates um, and write things in terms of the differences between diagonals instead of the diagonal lengths themselves, then you have something that's a subset of the hypercube. Um, and it turns out that it's a big subset of the hypercube, um, that you have probability um, asymptotic to exactly this, um, but it should take you n to the three halves tries to get a set of diagonals that works. So you can just rejection sample and it's fast enough. Um, uh, my postdoc, uh, Kyle Chapman, has a very explicit description of the moment polytope using some ideas from algebraic geometry and combinatorics. I um, mean, he can sample faster than this, uh, but he has to sort of pre-compute a table of probabilities that describe all the simplices inside the moment polytope. Um, uh, so look for his paper on archive, it's really cool. Um, so I should say that, you know, you can do this whole sampling thing in three lines of code or something, um, uh, and it works nicely. Um, uh, there were two direct sampling algorithms before this, um, but they both required you to know, um, they did it one, they more or less uh, only used one symmetry. So they had a piecewise polynomial um, PDF of degree n minus four, and you had to sample those piecewise polynomial PDFs independently to build up the polygon from start to finish. And the problem is that those um, piecewise polynomials have exceedingly large degrees and coefficients. So it's difficult to do numerically. You have to do it in extended precision arithmetic. Um, and it only works up to a couple hundred or something uh, before things get um, sort of numerically impossible. So you're talking about space curves. Space curves. The angles are just sampled uniformly. The angles are just sampled uniformly. And yeah. Well, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> let, let me actually talk about that because right. it's not it's not completely clear that that's right. Remember that, 
Well, plane curve, that's one thing you might have to do, but plane curves are not symplectic. Plane, plane polygons are not a symplectic space. The dimension is wrong. So this statement about symplectic volume being computed this way does not necessarily mean that the correct measure on plane polygons is generated by the like submanifold. You know, it's not clear what the submanifold measure would mean here. That is certainly a way to sample closed planar equilateral polygons. Uh, and you will get samples, but I don't. I can't swear to that they're the, it's the right distribution. Mm. Um, okay, so once you have this picture, you can do things, right? So um, here are explicitly the um, expectations of the chord lengths in a random polygon. So if you take a random closed seven, uh, let's see, a random closed 10 gon and it's equilateral, and you want to know the expected distance between vertex one and vertex three, uh, vertex four, sorry, skipping three edges, uh, we can tell you that that expectation is precisely 111,499 over 78,400. Um, I don't know why you want to know this, except that it's a cool theorem. Um, uh, but for instance, uh, it's proved to be very handy in checking our numerical methods, right? Because you can certainly sample this. And, uh, and I guarantee you that we checked all of these and, you know, and amazingly, you know, or maybe not amazingly, because it's a theorem, uh, they do indeed converge to, you know, exactly these numbers and you can watch sort of you know, dumbstruck as the number of correct digits climbs relentlessly as you take more samples. Um, so the mystery now is explain these numbers, right? Um, oh, combinatoricists, right? Uh, so for instance, right, the expectation of a cord skipping 37 edges in 112 gon is precisely <laughs> this. Isn't it a delicious number? Um, about 4.6. <laughs> okay, so now, um, now what about planar polygons, right? So, and, and what about equilateral polygons in R7? or R13, or R258. You know, you really have a problem because all of this is based on the quaternionic complex thing and that does not generalize. Um, it doesn't go down to plane things, it doesn't go up to four dimensional things, it just is what it is. Um, so an alternate approach uh, is, um, uh, inspired by algebraic geometry, um, it's a GIT quotient, if you know what that means, and if you don't, you can ignore it. Um, uh, here's the clever idea. So, you might say, okay, what I'm saying is that polygons are these clouds of edges, these point clouds on the sphere, right? It's just all the edges. Um, and the polygon is closed if this distribution of edges on the sphere has center of mass at the origin. Um, so what I really want to do is express the manifold of um, configurations of n points on the two sphere or on whatever sphere I want to be in, the circle if I'm in the plane, um, as having a submanifold of configurations of n points whose center of mass is at the origin. Um, so how do I find the submanifold inside the big manifold? Well, I've already sort of modded out by r rigid rotations of the point cloud. That was rotation invariance. But if I go to a slightly larger group, that is to say the Mobius group, uh, you can prove that there's a unique rotation-free Mobius image of these um, black points, which are not centered, um, which moves everybody slightly. Uh, 
till I get a unique point cloud where they are centered. Taking a Mobius transformation will change the Euclidean center of mass. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're doing now is we're writing down the closed things not as a submanifold of the open things, but as a quotient manifold of the open things um, by modding out by the action of the Mobius group. And if you do that, you get a different description of the closed things. Now, you have to be a little careful. It's not a quotient of all the open things. It's a quotient of almost all the open things. After all, closed polygons and open polygons don't have the same topology. So you can't have a deformation retraction from one to the other. Um, but if you uh, eliminate, basically, configurations where more than half the points are, are coincident, then on the remainder of the space of open polygons, you can deformation retract to the closed ones. Um, and so we're building algorithms based on this structure to provide coordinates for equilateral polygons and a measure and sampling and so forth, sort of in a dimension invariant way. OK, uh, I'm like out of time, so I won't talk about topologically constrained random walks. Uh, um, and I'll just maybe say um, that I'm working with a group on plant roots now. Um, the cow pea thing was original. So if anybody has a good idea for comparing uh, shapes of trees or even better, what we actually have is shapes of pictures of trees, that is to say pictures of the roots of these plants, please talk to me because it's not clear that any of this is really the right thing to do. Um, thank you very much. So we have time for a quick question. Okay. Question following up what Mark asked at the beginning of the talk. Um, so when you compare your method with the quaternions with the standard RMSD alignment, Uh, that's, that's right. I think that's right. Um, you would know, you know, it's going to become very clear if you made such a matrix of distances, you know, uh, you know, unrelated, 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 you know, very related. But at least you get, you know, a count of the number of bits of significance of a match, um, you know, in, an, in, a, in a natural way. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how you do that with RMSD. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> Ah, no, um, this is actually like another one of these, uh, you know, appeal for help kind of things, uh, which I thought I'd make here. We did some proof of concept things where we, where we grouped proteins, but we got far enough to realize we should partner with like a biomath group um, because, you know, we're mathematicians, right? I mean, we could download the PDB and clean it up and make a big list of, you know, distances or something. Um, but it's not clear that we'd be doing something that would be useful to the bio community. So the stage we're in now is we're going to talks and we're showing, you know, showing the proof of concept thing and, you know, hoping that someone will be interested enough to collaborate with us on it. So it's, oh, well, let's talk. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, but yeah, it's not published anywhere. Probably a, a question about semantics. It seems to me like it's, you presented as a notion of distance on, on the space of curves, but it seems to be on the tangents of the curves. 
it's it's a Sobolev yeah. metric on the space of curves, right? So it's. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, yeah, certainly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Sobolev metric, so it's a metric on tangent spaces, if you like. Yeah. So you have a frame on the curve? Yes. Oh yes. Okay. So uh, I, I I can't. You got to let me to tell you one theorem of my <laughs> student. Okay. So you know how there was a symmetry here, um, uh, and there was a conserved quantity, which was which was height. Well, um, closed space curves are a symplectic structure. That's Tom's theorem. Uh, have a symplectic structure. That's Tom's theorem. Now, closed space curves have a symmetry which is move the base point right around the curve. That's an S1 symmetry. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's Hamiltonian. Uh, and the conserved quantity is total twist. <laughs> um, so this, uh, the, the twist rive link picture like actually fits in like really nicely. That's, that's for smooth curves? That's for smooth curves. So Tom's, Tom's thesis is on how this all works for smooth curves. Um, and it's great. It's, it's on archive. He's writing up the papers now. Um, but there are beautiful consequences for elastic rod theory and for link twist and writhe and for you know, the differential geometry of curvature and torsion and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but it would, even listing the theorems would, would take us far afield. <laughs> Okay, let's thank again the speaker.